Good morning, folk. Good morning, Tony. Let us be still now. Otherwise, you will not be able to hear anything of spirit. Spirit is a realm that could not be understood or grasped by the human mind. So we must all become aware that there is a voice speaking to us, but it's not speaking from the intellectual levels of the human mind. It has to be perceived by the spirit. Now today I'm sort of going to lead you, hopefully, in a realm what we call meditation. Now meditation is not something what we do, you know, because that's what we think, that we do, we meditate, we no. Meditation is when we become aware of a presence. And that presence is always here. It always speaks. But it does not shout. It's a still small voice and we must really be able to quieten our minds to come to the place where you can hear something. Because it's been a long time for humanity to come back to where it was in the beginning, before the world was. Now Jesus said that we should not lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust are corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where the thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Okay? So when the heart begins to perceive something higher than its own self-survival, than its own food and clothing and protection and whatever we think we need, and most of the time we are here to, uh, to bring some relief to the physical body, isn't that true? Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? Mm. But you know, Jesus did not come here to just bring relief to the physical body. He came to show us that we already have a body, eternal in the heavens, that neither corrupts nor ever is sick, nor ever is, well, what do you call it, lacks anything, because it is a self-contained, self-sustained body. It's called the body of Christ. Now isn't it strange that people have had a completely wrong idea of what the body of Christ is? So the body of Christ is not a whole bunch of humans together, you know, praising the Lord, you know. Nice, but that's not what we are talking about. We're talking about the spiritual body. And that body is already within you. Now when I say within you, it's not within your physical body. Because you do not have a physical body. There is only a spiritual body that God has ordained, you know. And we have been discussing greatly and sincerely have become aware of the fact that we, through knowledge, what we know today, the knowledge that we get from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we cannot attain to righteousness. Now when I say righteousness, it has nothing to do with moralism, okay? That's mis misinterpreted, in misinterpreted by what we know today as the clergy, by religious leaders and 
even, well, whatever, you know. We have believed that we need to change our moral, our morality. You know? Instead of lying, we start speaking the truth. <laughs> Instead of, you know, uh, well, whatever, what humanity does, it lies, it steals, it robs, it kills, it murders, it everything that the human being is really a devil. But you're not aware of it yet because we all are trying to survive, we're all trying to protect ourselves. And we have an ego, you know, me, my and myself. I've got to live and I've got to protect myself. Well, Jesus said, unless you let go of your human existence, your human lifestyle, even your beliefs about God and man and the universe, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. It all has to be left behind. See, so when Jesus came to his disciples, and I'll just read a little bit here. He said in, uh, in Matthew 4, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed them. Now, what does it all mean? They're having a good business there. They had a good fishing business. They were good making good money. And then somebody comes over the cro over the brow of a hill with a white coat on, you know what I mean, and long beard and blue by whatever eyes he's got. And there this man says, Follow me. Now, from any reasonable human standpoint, that is crazy. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's crazy to ask somebody who's got a good business going, follow me. Jesus came to reveal a mystery that has been hid from all human scrutiny and that mystery of course, we know is the advent of spirit. As a couple of meetings ago, I spoke about the descent of the dove. Now we know that the dove represents not only innocence, it has no gall, it has no bitterness. Mm. It only knows mm. the truth. And nothing can shift it from its foundation. Nothing can. Even a ten, ten thousand fall by the left and a thousand by the right hand, no evil can come to the dove realization. I am not flesh and blood. Are you hearing that? I'm not flesh and blood. I'm not human. You're not human? No. No, no, you're not human. Humanity is a, what we call a being that was human down the moment it says, I'm afraid. And from that feeling of fear, don't forget, from the feeling of fear, he entered into mortality. He became aware of a physical sense of body. Believe that his body was physical. But originally his body was not physical. 
otherwise Paul would not have said that we already have as a body made without hands, eternal in the heavens. So the body is not physical. Because the physical body has need of everything. Food, clothing, protection, love, everything what we need. You know what I mean? And now we have to come and make a decision. Do we want to continue to live in a mortal body, distant to any kind of thing what can happen? Anything can happen to the physical body and to the circumstances that you live in. Anything can happen. Now, you know, I mean, we are all subject to Murphy's Law. How can we escape the wrath of this law of as you sow, so shall you reap. Whatever you believe in the heart, so shall it be given unto you. What do you believe in your heart? Okay. So then it says, do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Now what is the treasure? The treasure is the spiritual body. The true body that's spiritual, that is omnipresent. I am omnipresent. I am omniactive. And the purpose of omniscience and omnipotence and everything what this body represents, because that's the body of Christ, isn't that wonderful? If you can realize that, you transcend from all your beliefs about church and beliefs and everything about God and man and the universe, you come to realize that it's all man-made. All religions are man-made. The philosophy of whatever we know as body, is man-made. And I was seeing that on the uh, sort of the, on the news, that now they can make human ears, they can make human fingers, they can make livers, they can make, even can make hearts now. And they're even working on making the cell, brain cells. Can you just imagine that they can clone all these things or make all these things? The so-called, what they think is adven, advance or that we get to know more than we, the more how to preserve this physical life or even, you know, whatever. But Jesus said that it will corrupt and fall apart at the scene. Never mind how, how nice it is and how you know how prosperous it is, or how good it is, or how healthy it is. So there was then a, a paradigm shift. We talked about it the other day. A paradigm shift. Now this shift is from darkness to light. In the beginning, Adam went through a paradigm shift from light to darkness. Now darkness represents a physical mortal sense of being that we live, that we think that we live in this physical sense what we call our body and that's our life. And it's hard not to believe it because you can say, well, you know, it's hard for you to say that, Tony. But yeah, I, I, I feel the pain. And I look in the mirror the other day and I'm not getting any younger. What's the matter? Where is this eternal immortal thing what you're talking about. Where is it? And I get emails from people, you know, that tell me all sorts of things. And this woman says, I asked this question because when Jesus walked the earth, he healed the multitudes of these diseases, he raised people from the dead, like in a tomb, in dead in a tomb, you know, dead, dead. 
I have heard so many comment on raising the dead, meaning awakening consciousness, and not about resurrecting a so-called dead body. Now, this woman, apparently she's been listening to Walter Lanyon and read his books and Joel and listened to my tapes and, and she said, I still don't know what you're talking about. After all that time, after all these books, and after all these tapes, and after all the teachings, she had not yet understood that the Truth is spiritually discerned and appreciated. You cannot understand any of the books of either Joel or, or, or Walter Lanyon or whatever writings we wrote, whatever it is on the internet, you cannot grasp it with the human mind. If you do or try to understand it, you'll die. You'll die in your sin. And you believe that you are a physical being with a physical body that this woman would like to see raised from the dead. Now she believes that the miracles that we are now sort of requiring today or would like to see a dead people being raised out of a coffin. Is that right? Is that what we like to see? There are no dead people in a coffin. simply that I know dead people. Because we have so, been so attached to the molecular structure or the atomic structure of the body, we think that we, that is me, that's my body, that's, and this is why we mourn. And we put a tombstone on the, on, you know, what, what do you, why do you do that? This is why Jesus said to this man who said, Follow me, and the man said, "Well, can I go and, uh, you know, and bury my father?" Because, on according to the Jewish tradition, you stay with your father and your mother until they are dead. So he had to wait to his to bury his father before he could follow Jesus. What's this story? What does it mean? What did Jesus say? Let the dead bury the dead. So people that are believing that they have physical bodies and their, their fathers and their mothers and their offspring also have physical bodies and all these physical bodies, you know, dead, they're dead. And we have believed that. How can we escape the corruption of this belief in a physical body? Because that is corruption. The physical body is not so much the body, it's the belief about it that is the corruption. Yeah. The belief about it. And the total commitment to getting this body well, or to getting this body wealthy or healthy or wise or whatever, and hoping and praying that when it dies, it goes to heaven when it dies. There's nothing going to heaven when something dies. That's why it says, seek the treasures which are in heaven. Lay up for yourself treasures upon, lay not for your tre treasures upon the earth where moth or rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. And that's talking about the physical body. So we have treasured this body, we have attacked it, we you know, we, we do it the right thing to it, and I suppose there's nothing wrong with it if you, especially if you don't yet realize fully what your true identity is. You need to look after the body and eat it, eat proper or whatever, you know what I mean? But in the long run, it's going to fail you. And I don't want to be failing, so I have to take the paradigm shift from not from light to darkness, but to, from darkness to light. Because that's why it says the light of the body is the eye. 
the I represent the awareness of that spiritual dimension we call our body. You know? While this body seems to corrupt and go away, we already have an eternal body in the heavens. But you know, people say, oh, we get that when we die. No, you don't get that when you die. You already got it. You're going to get come to realize that you already have. You already have a spiritual body, eternal in the heavens. Now the heavens are not up in the sky somewhere. There are no heavens in the sky. Heaven does not represent a place up in the sky. Neither does the meaning of God that there is a being up in the sky somewhere. That's, going, that's where we go to. We go to God, you know what I mean? That's what people say. We go to God. No, you're not going to God. You're already in there. And you will never leave there. And you will never be forsaken because God the Father has called you. And He said, nobody is ever going to see death. But while we are in death, we will see death. Do you understand that now? While we are in death, while we are in a human frame called body, we are in death. That's why Jesus said, let the dead that are in that physical central body, let them bury the dead. See? That's why we've got the tombstones. Tombstones are not Christian. Tombstones are Hebrew. Or Islam, you know, they all got tombstones. It is remembering the dead. How can you remember the dead if there aren't any? Isn't that crazy? Now, isn't that a paradigm shift to realize that there are no dead? That Jesus said, I am the resurrection. And I am the life, he that believeth on me, that we were dead, in his humanity, in his physical sense of life, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never see death, never see it. Because your eye is no longer dual. It's no longer looking to the left or to the right. We're looking at Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, lest we should be weary and faint in our minds. So if you still feel weary about the body and about the circumstances you are in, well, then you have to begin to become still and come into a state of meditation. Okay? There are many allegories that I can give you about these things, but the point is this, that Jesus was the first fruits. And this is uh, written by Audrey Drummond, you all know her, or have heard of her at least. Uh, she's a minister in the United States. Who said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded Moses, fill an omer of it, to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it upon before the Lord, to be kept for your generation. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbath shall be complete, even unto the morrow of the seventh Sabbath, shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now the, this period is known as the counting of the Omer. An omer is a unit or measure, and on the second day of the Passover, in the days of the temple, an omer of barley was cut down and brought to be to the temple as an offering. 
Why was it so important to count the days from the bringing of the Omer onto the Shavuot, Shavuot, which means the, uh, <coughs> the Sabbath in Hebrew? It has to do with harvest and bringing of the Omer was the first fruit harvesting of the new grain crop. So what is the important to Christians? And Jesus Christ is the first fruit from the dead, remember? But notice this first is plural. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept in death. Wow. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Of his own will begotten us with the word of truth that we should become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's James 1, 18. So there you are. We are coming to a place where we now come to this paradigm shift and that is speaking of the 50th day on the day of Pentecost is when the the Messiah or the Christ was married to his church or actually the consummation of the marriage was when the spirit the dove descended upon us and joined us together as one body and we become a, a praise offering unto God. We are the body of Christ. Do you know that? We are the fullness of Him that fills all in all. But there is no male, there is no female, there is no black, there is no white, there is no religion of any sort. They are the first fruit from the dead body, from the corpse. You know that? That's one of the corpse, you know. We were driving to a shell in, uh, in uh, narrow water somewhere. Druen. To Druen. To Druen, yeah. And on the way we saw a, there's a church there called Corpus Christi. <coughs> and really what corpse means is corpse means a dead body. And Corpus Christi is a is what I would call uh, a double. You cannot have a corpse in Christ at the same time. You understand that? It's googly gook. You cannot have corpus Christi. It's impossible. You cannot have a dead body and and then think that this is sort of live. You cannot have a live dead body. So we are no longer part of the corpse of the dead body that was actually not only given well to blot out everything what we know as humanity when Jesus died and said it was finished that corpse we call humanity but was generated in Genesis chapter 2 where men said I'm afraid he descended into the corpse into the dead body into the dead you know something that doesn't live forever it dies three score and ten hopefully maybe a bit more and then you know but that's not true that's not true so now the the question was asked me why is it that when the turn of the century came or actually long before that let's say on the day of Pentecost or after great signs and wonders were done by his holy child Jesus you know what I mean by the Spirit many signs and wonders were done now what does that represent does it mean then that signs and wonders are simply uh, that we as human beings have to heal the sick or raise the dead or do something? No, that's not what it means at all. John the Baptist wondered about that. When he was cast into prison for his, well, because, he, he, because of his faith, 
he was, you know, he was. Uh, but then he was not so certain anymore whether it was whether Jesus was the Messiah, when Jesus was the Christ. And some of John the Baptist's disciples, John the Baptist said, "Go to the to this Jesus and tell him, are you the Messiah?" You know, he wanted to make sure because he wasn't sure. Now he's locked up in the prison. Uh, obviously, going to get his head cut off. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> you got to get ahead without a head, you know. But the point is this: that Jesus said, after the disciples, John the Baptist's disciples said, uh, "Is there another Messiah to come? Is there something else to come?" Then Jesus said, "Tell John that." The sick are healed, the dead are raised, and the hungry are fed, and all these things have come about. When you see all these things happening among you, you must get the emphasis right now. The, the purpose of the kingdom of God coming is not just heal the sick, raise the dead, and doing that. But the evidence is there when the kingdom of God comes and then these signs will follow. The signs of the Spirit will follow when we realize what we owe, that we are the body of Christ. That we are not the Corpus Christi, but that we are the living Christ. The body of Christ. See? Do you understand that? We're no longer looking at a dead man on a cross. That was the realm of torture. That's where we all died. That's where we all ceased to be. Legally, that is. But we still wander around like shook with our with heads cut off. And we're still bleeding to death. We have no idea yet what the truth is concerning the gospel. Alright. Now in the book of Acts, chapter 8, I think it is. Now this is the Acts of the Apostle. And this is first of all speaking about Paul who was consenting to the death of Stephen. Stephen was, you know, being the, the first martyr. He was stoned to death because of the faith. At least they thought they killed him, but they can't kill him. And it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at the time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and made great lamentations over him, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they, they were scattered abroad, when everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, you know who Philip was? Philip was with Jesus, remember? When Philip said, Lord, you know, because show us the Father. We would love to see the Father. We want to know the true God, not this God that punishes and rewards. We want to know the true God, the Father. Then Jesus said, Philip, have I been so long with you and you have not yet seen me? Don't you know that I am he that liveth and I was dead and behold, I was al I'm alive forevermore. Now that's strange. I'm he that liveth and was dead. When was Jesus dead? When he was born into the world, he was born in of a woman, born under the law, and in other words, he was born with a physical body that was subject to death, just like every one of us have a physical body that's subject to death. So he died as the last Adam. 
and bore in his own body on the tree, he bore everything but humankind suffers under it. But you know, don't stop there, because a lot of people stop there. There is a higher realm to be revealed to the church today. Revival has to come. And this parable in the Old Testament regarding the, om, the Omer, that's all symbolic of the, of the revelation that is now dawning on the church when the mind is no longer concerned about physical whatever it is. It's now beginning to say, speak Lord, your servant is listening. I want to know you and I want to know the power of your resurrection and I want to know the fellowship of your suffering, even if I have to physically die. I want to know the truth, don't you? But I want to know the truth about body. Because that is the truth. The truth is that body of Christ is an omnipresent activity. It's the power that gives light to the sun, that upholds the earth, and hangeth the earth in nothing. That's all that Christ's body has done there. Because the government is given to that body. The government of this body of Christ is no longer a single man called Jesus. The body of Christ is a multi-membered, you know, body. And I'm not talking about people now, okay? A multi-membered body have nothing to do with people or religious beliefs or whatever it is. It has nothing to do with it. The body of Christ is the omnipresent wisdom and activity of spirit that maintains and sustains everything by the word of its own power. Yeah, beautiful. It's so wonderful. Mm. Isn't it? Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracle that he did. And unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and the lame were, were healed, and there were great joy in that city. Now, you would say, everybody would be delirious, uh, happy about something is happening. There's a shift from this physical being that we think we are to that spiritual dimension we called the kingdom of heaven. Because that's what John the Baptist said. When you see those things happening, the kingdom of heaven has come among you. You might say, well, okay, now this woman is saying, why isn't it happening now? That's a good question, isn't it? Why isn't it happening now? If it's God's will for these things, why isn't it happening now? Because we have not yet come to the, rev the revelation of what the kingdom of God is. You know? So we have to seek the treasures that are in a higher realm. Treasures that are immortal. They are invisible. They are incorruptible. They will never cease. They will never corrupt or go away. It is a realm of spirit. I am spirit. You are spirit being. You are. You are spirit being. Can you hear this? Awake thou that sleep and arise from the dead. And Christ, which is your life, will light you up. <coughs> now he said that to Ephesians. Awake thou that sleep and arise from the dead. He said that to Ephesians, they were supposed to be spiritual, spiritual Christians. Why do I have to say, why did he have to say to Christians, awake thou that sleep and arise from the dead? Because they were still living in physical bodies. They still thought that the physical body was the thing that God is looking on, whether it does behave itself, whether it sins. Whether it is, you know, whether you lie or cheat or do anything at all. And we believe that, that God knew about that. 
So we have long prayers for those that do the, the wrong thing. We pray for people that sin, and we pray for the sick, and we pray for this, and we do this, and we pray that, and somehow it's not happening. Why isn't that happening? Because we have not yet fully understood that we are the body of Christ. And we have to live in the light of it, otherwise it won't work. So if I, I is single, that means that we can see clearly the one that rose from the dead, ascended on high, and I know that I'm complete in it. I can't touch it, I can't see it with my head, you know, with my hands. I cannot see, I cannot touch Jesus, unless I touch you. Because <laughs> there's only Jesus, or Christ rather, Christ Jesus. That's what Saul of Tarsus, after that he was, you know, bore witness to the stoning of Stephen. After that, he had an experience on the road to Damascus. He had an experience and he was blinded by this light that came from heaven and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He must have been convicted after he, after he saw Stephen being stoned to death and said, my, you know, he, he was the first one that could say, Father, forgive them. Do not hold that sin against them. And you know what happened then? This man that they killed was transferred from the, the so-called death into the, and he saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And it was Stephen was standing at the right hand of God. You are my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. And that's the thing. You know, when we learn to forgive our persecutors and the, the ones that speak evil about you or do the wrong thing to you, you got to forgive because they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. And it's providing that you do not live in matter itself or in physical body or physical beliefs. You can do that, but I don't think you can do that if you still f live in physical body because a drown in will grab at a straw. Wouldn't we, I mean, we have tried to do that, but somehow it's not easy, is it? On a physical level, it's not evil, you know, forgive them, they don't know what they do, they're just, they're just ignorant. But you know that ignorance is the reason why people perish. It's not because of anything else but ignorance, not knowing that we are the offspring of God, we are spiritual beings. Yeah. Then there was great joy in the city. Isn't that wonderful? But then there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So he was puffing himself up, you know what I mean? As a physical man and took sort of authority over the whole area. To whom all they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying, this man is a great power of God. That's what they thought. And to him they had regard. To whom do you pray regard? No. Do we all pray regard to man whose breath is in his nostril? Or do we pray regard to the one that has no form? to adore or even to look towards. He's invisible. We adore that invisible God that is among us, that through us, and it's as us, because you are that body. You are that spiritual body that will never ever see death. That will never even get sick or lonely or desperate or whatever it is. You come to that realization, you can be, you find yourself peaceful in any situation in any circumstance. That's what you call practicing the presence. But you know, got to practice this realization. You know, it is by faith, yes. 
But it's not by sight, it's by faith. It's not by the evidence of the senses that we are secure and feel safe. It's by the Spirit bearing witness that this is so. Bearing witness, speaking to us in psalms, in spiritual songs, making melody unto the Lord. But when they believed, in the wonderful, when they believed Philip preaching the kingdom, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were all baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and he was baptized and continued with Philip and wondered, Behold the signs and the wonders and the miracles that were done by the apostles. Now when the apostles went, went to Jerusalem, they heard that Samaria also had received the word of God and sent them Peter and John, who when then they had come prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet it was not fallen, the dove had not descended upon them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. But the Holy Ghost yet was not descending upon them. But they made a commitment. They were baptized in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost, in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized in the commitment and then they lay hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And then when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, give me also that power. See, his motive was that he might have the power to heal the sick, to do the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And that's not what the Holy Ghost is given. The Holy Ghost is given to us to give us understanding who we truly are in Christ Jesus. Amen. And to know each other, no longer after the flesh, after a moral, mortal, you know, structural man called Adam, or whatever you like to call yourself. But after that, which is invisible. So I, or you and I, I think you and I, but there's only one I. There's only one only begotten of the Father. And I'm completing it, you are completing it, we are only one. That's why we call it the body of Christ. Because we are all baptized into one body. But the body is not just a, a saying or a cliche. The body of Christ has the awareness of the spiritual dimension of what was in the beginning with God. You know? In other words, the body of Christ was in the beginning with God. Unto all dominion and power that was given. That's what it says in Genesis 1. You shall have dominion over every thing that walks, flies, creeps and swims. And the kingdom of God was then in operation until man fell from his high state and descended into mortality. Who wants to live in mortality? <laughs> well, well, Tony, how can I get out of mortality? Everybody around me is dying and what all this is happening. No, they're not dying. You still look with dual eyes, with dead eyes, you're looking at the appearances of things and you think and have opinions about it all, but all the opinions is not going to do anything for you. You must believe God. You must believe that God is. And that is, is the body of Christ. You must believe that God is the body of Christ. The body of Christ is God. God's body, you know. <laughs> it's a hearing body. Yeah. A body had thou prepared for me. Sacrifice and offering for sin. That was all moralism. You understand? Hebrewism is moralism. And most of Christianity today is moralism. And we still try to sacrifice or appease. So the wrath of God, but God has no wrath at all. The law has wrath. Because we are alienated from the true essence of law and principle. Mm. And then our whole body in darkness, 
when we cannot hear that, when we cannot see that. So in the book of Mark, Matthew, Mark, in the book of Mark, in the book of Mark, and he said, He said unto them, take heed what you listening to. Take heed what you hear. Do you still listen to the testimony of the senses that tells you I got a pain and I got this going on and that's happening to me and that's happening? It's not happening to you. Nothing can ever happen to you. So your problem is not in that you are not absolutely perfect in holy and blameless before God, it is you attribute your own problems to yourself and you say, why is this happening? Because you have drawn it to yourself. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that all, but I know one thing, it's not God that causes these troubles. You can't blame God for all the troubles that are in the world today. It's simply ignorance. And the body of Christ is responsible to find out their true identity and their body so that we can be a light, huh? a light to those that yeah. need us. Yeah. What's more greater, a cure for cancer or the need for revelation? Mm. Huh? I think the need for revelation is far greater needed than anything else. It's a revelation that we are not mortals. Mm. So, take heed what you hear, with what measure, or the way you are hearing it, it will be met unto you. And unto you that hear, more shall be given, or more light shall be given. For he that has light and understanding about the body, to him shall be given, and he that had not, from him shall be taken even that he what he thinks he has. Mm. Now so is the kingdom of God. See, always coming back, so is the king of God. See? As if a man should cast a seed into the ground and should sleep and ride day and night, and the seed should bring up and grow up, he knoweth not how. But the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, and after that the full corn of the ear. And when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle, sickle because the harvest is come. And he says, Wherefore unto we liken the kingdom of God? And how can we compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed. When it is sown in the earth, is less than least of all than not in the earth, but when it is sown in the earth, it's only just a little bit of light that is at the point of recognition, the point when you suddenly become alert or aware of something greater than your physical condition, your physical situation, whatever is happening in the family or in, in the business or whatever, suddenly, you know, you go to the restroom and sit down and Sit there and because you can be quiet for a while, suddenly it comes. You might be driving a car where you no longer have to think about everything and nobody talking to you. Suddenly a little light comes up. This little seed, like a mustard seed, it comes into the heart. And it begins to spring up. You've got to protect it, keep it. Keep it in the midst of your heart. Let it not depart from your awareness. Because that's the little seed that will spring up into a big mount, big wonderful tree. Can you just imagine a little acorn, and the little acorn comes this big oak tree? Such is the body of Christ. When it receives the light, in the body of Christ, if the light is dawning in the body of Christ, that we are not mortals, destined to die, or even destined to go to hell, Nobody's going anywhere. That's all. That's all religious nonsense. We are not going anywhere. There is no place to go anywhere. We are already there. 
but you must awaken to it. We are a sleeping giant, that's what the church today is. A sleeping giant, not aware of its own true potential, not knowing that we have the power to bring reconciliation to mankind by revealing the mystery of the spiritual body. Yeah. You know, God is spirit. And those that come to God must believe that He is and worship Him in spirit yeah. and in truth. Okay? So, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge unto the shadow of it. For that re represents, of course, that everybody or all those that are thirst and hunger for reality will come to, to your light, yeah. to the rising, the, the brightness of thy rising, arise, shine. For the light has come, and the glory of God is risen upon you. Like Jesus said, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world. What, what was that kind of glory? The realization <coughs> that I'm an immortal being, that I can never see death, that I'm from everlasting to everlasting. That's the glory of the light that shines. And God commands it. He commands it even this morning. That light to shine out of darkness, out of that state that we drifted in Adam, we all died and we all experienced mortality and death but now God commands the light to shine out of darkness to give us back the light of the knowledge of the glory in the face of Jesus Christ and we have this treasure in heavenly places within you it's not within your body it's within your consciousness. Your consciousness is not in the body. You are not in the body. Some people say, well, you know, I, I, I think I'm over here somewhere in my head or in my heart. No, you're not. You're not anywhere in the body. You're not in your hands. You're not in your feet. You're not in your eyeballs. You're not there. You're not in the animal called body. You are spirit and you are omnipresent. You are omniactive. The same as God is, but it's the light of it that causes the resurrection from the dead. Yeah? Do you believe that? Yeah. You believe that we are now going back to a paradigm shift the other way around? From darkness to light. Mm. And God will light up your pathway. He says, I lead in the way of righteousness. And in the way of righteousness, there is no death. Huh? In the pathway thereof. What, are, what is righteousness? The divine courses of thought that flow from the heavenly realms that are already here to your conscious mind and you become to hear it. Only when you become still enough to hear it, as long as you don't struggle with what we call appearances and things around about you. Don't struggle with it. Go and sit in the restroom for a while and you will rest there <laughs> and begin to hear something. And when the hearing comes, faith comes. Faith comes by hearing. The substance of what you have need of is already there. <coughs> it's the evidence of things what you cannot perceive with your five mm. physical senses. Yes. So you've got our spiritual senses given to you so you can discern what good and evil is. Mm. i just read that in the closing in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter Five. Talking about Jesus first of all. In verse eight, thou he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. He suffered as a human, like we have suffered as humans, and being made perfect. He was made perfect, 
Then he became the author of eternal salvation unto all to them that obey him. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. In other words, the hearing, we have hardened the heart. Then it says, for when we, he's talking to the Hebrews here, but I suppose he's talking to us as well. And for a time you ought to be teachers, you need one to teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For anyone, everyone that uses milk is unskillful. And is unskillful in the word of righteousness. See, righteousness has been misconstrued to me to mean moral excellence. You know, that you wouldn't even spit on the sidewalk, you know what I mean? That you're so holy that you, you know that you almost radiate his glory in your humanity. But that's all a lie. No human can be exalted to be holy. Okay? But it said be holy, even as I am holy. Okay. And what's that holiness? That's the spiritual realization that we are the offspring of God. Spirit, soul and body. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age or mature or perfect, says in the margin, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It doesn't say to discern between good and evil. To say that's good and that's evil. We have concluded that both good and evil are all in the realm of the material sense world that has opposites. See? But the true, the, the true one that knows the truth knows that both good and evil come from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we have regarded that as error, as wrong, because it does not exist in God. Good and evil are sort of imaginary realms that existed ever since men said, I'm afraid, and began to live in a material world, dying, <coughs> evil dying. But now, we are risen. We can leave behind the law and all that stuff, and even all the Old Testament in it. I mean, I'm telling you, in the Old Testament, there is a threat that leads to that revelation, what I'm talking to you now. It's right there. I call it a stardust trail. It, 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 it's there, but it can never be recognized with the sensual mind. No. But it's there. Mm -hmm. And our hearts are open to receive it. Mm -hmm. And when the seed comes in, it brings forth, it springs forth, and it brings forth fruit 30 fold, 60 fold, and 100 fold. For such is the kingdom of God, and now it is at hand. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Bye.